Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Bruce Cabot in Kurt Carroll's The Golden Herd on the Hallmark Playhouse. Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present our dramatization of a story by Kurt Carroll called The Golden Herd. There is in American history an almost inexhaustible background for the kind of fiction in which personal adventure and historical fact are combined. And The Golden Herd is such a story. In it, we have the affairs of individuals set against the great theme of expanding America, the opening up of the Southwest a century ago, the problems of the Mexican frontier, and the founding of a great cattle empire. To play the leading role in The Golden Herd, we have chosen that very fine actor, Bruce Cabot. And now, a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of Kurt Carroll's The Golden Herd. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar, for birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Kurt Carroll's The Golden Herd, starring Bruce Cabot. The year was 1860. Along the banks of the Nueces River, in that portion of Texas which adjoins Mexico, great cotton plantations had spread over the fertile miles. Big white manor houses echoed with the laughter of beautiful women from the finest old families of Louisiana and Virginia. They were the rich immigrants, but also there were the poor, the very poor, and one of them was Carl Miller. It was along towards sundown. I was riding up the river bottom toward my cabin when I spotted him. A wild steer, I undid my lariat and started for him. But he saw me too quick and plunged up the riverbank and into one of the cotton fields. I went after him. Crossed the rows of cotton around the barn, up a carriage path, and then, right in the middle of somebody's front lawn, I swung the lariat. Father, come here quickly. Father! I looked around for that voice. It came from the veranda of the big house. And when I saw her, I knew whose plantation I was on, the Allerby place. It just had to be because Julia Allerby was known as the prettiest girl in this part of Texas. Her dark hair tumbled in long braids down over her bare shoulders. Young man, get that beast off our lawn. What do you mean doing such a thing? Well, nothing, ma'am. I, I guess I was just having some fun. Fun? Father, did you hear? Yes, Julia, yes. Tell me, boy, would you learn to throw a steer like that? Well, sir, I used to watch the vaqueros when I was a kid. The vaqueros? Too bad they've all gone back to Mexico. We could do with some of them to keep these critters out of our cotton. By the way, I'm Jasper Allaby. I'm Carl Miller. Father, make him get that animal out of here before it kicks the lawn to pieces. Well, now, I'd be glad to pay for the damage I've done if uh, I had the money. You can pay for it, Mr. Miller, by bringing me a couple more of them steers. But, Father... Beef is better eaten than pork, Julia. Maybe some steaks will make those field hands of ours get up and pick cotton for a change. I'll have the steers for you tonight, Mr. Ellerby. You mean you got them already? Uh, no, sir, but there are hundreds of them running wild all through the bottomlands. Then I'll make you a deal, boy. Three head of cattle every week, two dollars a head. Think you can do it? I know I can. Mr. Miller. Yes? You don't talk like a southerner. Well, I was born in Germany. My father and I settled across the river about 20 years ago. I see. And you don't like us newcomers. I hadn't even thought about it. One thing more. 
Where in the world did you buy such queer-looking clothes? I didn't buy them, Miss Allerby. I, I made them. Every week after that, I returned to the plantation. I looked forward to delivering the cattle to Mr. Allerby, not... Not so much for the money as for a glimpse of Julia. Of course, most of the time, she didn't even see me. There were too many other men. Men with soft hands and fancy manners hovering around her on the veranda. And then, one day, she was alone. Mr. Miller, when are you going to teach me to ride? What? Don't look so startled. Lady on horseback isn't so disgraceful, is she? Well, not to me, but perhaps your father and your friends might... Oh, they'll be shocked, naturally. How about tomorrow morning? Like this. Go on, keep your shoulder relaxed. Uh huh. And then. That's a Mexican love song, isn't it? Yes, it is. The vaqueros taught it to me when I was a boy. They called it El Recuerdo del Porvenir, the memory of the future. The memory of the future. When you don't have what you want in the present, there's always the future. They're the only memories that count. Yes. Sometimes I wish... Wish what? Oh, nothing. It's been a wonderful afternoon, Carl. we better start back. I knew what stood between us. The name Allerby and a big white plantation house and servants and a dozen young men with soft hands. But Texas was a place where even a German immigrant could make the future he wanted. I started delivering wild cattle to more and more plantations that saw the value of cheap meat for their field hands. Then I drove a herd clear out to San Antonio. In San Antonio, I bought myself some city clothes. I was away three months. Doggone, we've missed you, boy. Got some more beef for me? Three yearlings. Good. Mr. Allaby, uh, is your daughter home? Sure, sure. Say, uh, too bad you went and bought those store clothes. Well, why, sir? Well, you'll just be trading them in for a uniform, won't you? A uniform? Yeah. Don't you get any news out on the range? Texas has seceded. Joined the Confederacy. It'll be any day now. Mr. Allaby, if your daughter's in, I... Didn't should... I say she was? Try out in the patio. Thank you, sir. You're late, Brian. I thought... The... Oh, Carl. Who's Brian? Brian Boswell. You remember him. Tall, red hair. Oh. Oh, yes. One of the veranda sitters. What? You've changed, Julia. Oh, in three months? Yes, you have. You're even prettier. Oh, thank you. By the way, you've changed quite a bit yourself. I've changed. Oh, oh. Oh, you mean the clothes? Yes. Somehow I never thought of you as... <laughs> well... A gentleman, you mean? You see, I didn't come to America to be a gentleman. That was a trouble in Europe. Too many gentlemen and noblemen who thought their country was made for them alone. Here in America, every man can win for himself and be respected. Just for himself. Oh, Carl, you're angry. I'm sorry, but I feel pretty strongly about it. Julia! Yes, Brian? Brian, I think you've met Carl Miller. Oh, yes, I believe so. Hello. Brian has just received his commission, Carl. Captain of the Mounted Volunteers. My congratulations, Captain. Well, thank you. By the way, Miller, I hear you're an excellent horseman. I might be able to find a place for you in my company. I'm sorry, Captain, I'm not fighting. Oh? Carl, you can't mean that. But I do. I can't take sides in your war, Julia, because I don't want to be a Yankee or a Southerner. Only an American. I came to your country to help build it up, not destroy it. That's not a reason, sir. It's an excuse. Julia, you understand me, don't you? I do. And I have no respect for weaklings or cowards. Julia. Brian, I can give you my answer now. It's yes. I'll marry you whenever you say. With one word, 
Julia had swept away all my hopes and plans. I decided there was nothing for me to do except saddle up and head west. I wanted new places and new faces. I heard it cattle in the Nevada Territory pan gold in California, but... Well, I just couldn't forget Texas, or Julia, or the war. The great victory which both North and South had been so sure of retreated through 62, 63, 64, and finally 65 in exhaustion. In the fall of that year, I decided to go back. I had to, because Texas was where I belonged. It was late afternoon when I rode into the town of Tilden. I tied up at Eaton's General Store, kind of planning to get some supplies. I say, what if we haven't paid our bill in two years? Try to collect it, Tom Eaton. Just try and do it, sir. Don't you worry, Jeff Mallaby. I'll come in. Mr. Allerby. Young man, I advise you to go elsewhere for your purchases. That fellow inside is a low-down carpetbagger. <laughs> Mr. Allerby, don't you remember me, Carl? It isn't possible. Carl Miller. <laughs> Son, you got to come right home with me. Julia's going to be mighty glad to see you. And how is she, sir? Pretty as ever. Thinner, of course. Times are real bad, son. Now, mind you, Julia and I aren't complaining. Julia? Well, where's Brian? Take a look at that poster on the wall there. $1,000 will be paid in gold for the capture of... The capture? Yep. Blame fool is still fighting. Raiding government warehouses, burning army barracks, then hightailing it into Mexico. I'm beginning to be thankful she didn't marry him after all. Mr. Allaby, you can say that again. Huh? <laughs> well, sure. It uh, looks like she's going to be an old maid. Here, boy. Hold on. Where are you going? To Julia. <laughs> Fancy silk dress now, it was faded cotton. Her face was tired, but still beautiful and proud. Carl! Oh, Carl, let me look at you. And you, Julia? <laughs> First time I ever saw you, you came galloping across our lawn, just as you did now. But the lawn is gone, like everything else. It doesn't matter, Julia. There's always another chance. Not here, not for us. We're going to sell the plantation. No, Julia, no. The land is everything. We'll make something of it. Bigger and more lasting. A new Texas, Julia. A new Southwest. Why, together we can do anything. Together? You forget I'm still engaged to Brian. Julia. We decided to wait until after the war. So whenever he comes home... He can't, Julia. He's an outlaw. He's deserted you. What about you? Didn't you desert, too? Well, Brian stayed and fought. You ran off to the West. You still think I'm a coward? I do. If you've come back for me, Carl, it's useless. Go back to your west. No, Julia. I thought there might be other places, but this is the land I grew up in. I'm part of it. And I'm going to stay here and help make it great again. No, with or without you, Julia, I'm staying. <laughs> moment, we'll return to the second act of The Golden Herd, starring Bruce Cabot. The other night I was reading, and uh, browsing is probably a better word to describe it, and came across a quotation that seems particularly appropriate to our day and age, even though it was first written centuries ago. It's from the writings of that early Roman statesman and philosopher, Seneca, and it goes, Lack of confidence is not the result of difficulty. Difficulty comes from lack of confidence. Today we tend to call it morale, but either word describes a spirit, a feeling that actually can be transmitted from one person to another. We can give another person heart and courage by our very voice or manner, by not only what we say, but by the way we say it. And that's something to think about these days. We of Hallmark like to think our cards give more than a moment's pleasure to the sender and the receiver. 
because you'll never find a Hallmark card that doesn't also give a lift to the spirits. In fact, you might call them couriers of courage, the kind thoughts of one person being transmitted to another person. And we all know that these days, more than ever, that's important. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of The Golden Herd, starring Bruce Cabot. The year 1865 was drawing to a close. Carl Miller had come home to find Texas broken by the war and confused by the peace. Some of Carl's friends had died. Others had drifted south to Mexico to fight with the French troops of Emperor Maximilian. Now it was up to Carl to build a new life, a life still without Julia Alibi. I'd been home about a week. It was early evening and I was puttering around my cabin, trying to make the place a little more livable. I heard hoofbeats coming up the path. Almost before they halted, footsteps ran on the porch. Light footsteps. A woman's. I see you still ride like the wind, Julia. Carl. Tom Eaton just stopped by the house. Did he sit down? No. I just came to tell you we won't accept charity. We'll pay our own bills at Mr. Eaton's store. But when? He's been carrying you for the last two years. That's not your affair. If... Well, let's not argue about it, Julia. It's too late. He's already taken my money. It's no good, Carl. It won't work. I won't play the grateful woman. I won't turn against Brian. I'd hoped you thought better of me. Julia, listen. Your credit's good with Eaton now. You can buy the supplies you need. Carl, we can't plant 6,000 acres of cotton without money. You can raise cattle. Slaves. No, we can't. Not cattle. Texas isn't look, Julia. Cotton made this state important, and beef's going to make it great. And that takes money again. Not necessarily. Carl, somebody's coming. Julia! It's Brian. Julia! Come on, Julia. I'm taking you home. Come on. Just a minute, Boswell. Julia and I were talking. Oh, I'm afraid you've wasted your time, Miller. I'm taking Julia to Mexico with me. Mexico? But Brian... It's the only way, Julia. With the troops looking for me, we can't stay in Texas. And it means always running, always hiding. Not in Mexico. My dear, I'll give you everything you've had here. A fine plantation, servants, that money... That is if Emperor Maximilian makes good his promises, Boswell. Maximilian? What are you talking about, Carl? Simply that the French army is recruiting Americans to help put down the Mexican rebellion. They're promising lands and money. Brian, you are going to join them. He has. French agent tried to sign me up. He said he already had Boswell. But we have no right to take sides in their war. Julia, you're talking like Miller. Perhaps she doesn't want a plantation that's bought with a French bribe. Mr. Miller, you'll apologize for that. I will not. Right, now, Carl, stop it. Then there's only one way to settle this. Well, that's up to you, Boswell. At no. sunrise. Oh, no, no. The river bottom by the crossing. I'll be there. A duel is a stupid, meaningless act. But I had to go through with it if I was ever to convince Julia that I wasn't a coward. A few minutes before dawn, I rode down to the river bottom. Brian was waiting. And Julia was there with her father. Mr. Alibi, will you act as judge? I intend to. You stand back to back. Then on my count, walk 20 paces. You will then turn and fire. Are you ready, gentlemen? Ready. Ready. One, two, three, four, I looked five, back at Julia. Six, seven, If eight, I killed Brian, she'd five, never forgive me. Ten. And if he killed seven, me... Twelve, <laughs> thirteen, Well, by the way, I was bound to lose. Sixteen. I turned at that sound. It was the troops from the garrison. Drop your gun, Boswell. You're under military arrest. <laughs> Julia, Julia, you've got to believe it. Never. You wouldn't even fight Brian like a man. You took the coward's way. You told the troops where they'd find him. Julia, stop it. Coward, coward, coward. Brian had 
won without even firing a shot. I'd lost again, and for the last time. Then, suddenly I realized that with Brian in prison, Julia had lost, too. They took him to the small army post outside Tilden. I'd been on the post many times. I knew the barracks, which they used for the prisoners. The windows were barred, but the walls were wood. There just, there just might be a chance. That night, I circled behind the post and crawled up to one of those outlying huts. I heaped a pile of brush against it and lighted it. The fire drew every man on the post and left me free to get Brian. I chop a hole in this wall, run for it. I got an extra horse for the side gate. Miller, I never expected you. I'm doing this for Julia. I don't want her to have to wait another five years for you. All right. If they ever find out you did this... It won't matter. I'm heading for the range as soon as we're out of here. Now get Julia and head for Mexico tonight. <laughs> About a lot of things. Julia was gone. It'd never be another. Not for me. But there was still the land. It was still there, waiting. Waiting for an idea and a man to make it work. And when I thought of that, I felt a lot better. that many? Well, they aren't. I split them up on the other plantations. These 200 are for you. (laughs) You're going to make cattlemen out of us whether we like it or not. Well, you are going to like it, aren't you? It's the answer for all of us, son. How about coming in the house and cleaning up? Thank you, sir. By the way, boy, I, uh, I owe you an apology. You do? For what? Well, I guess I was the one that told the troops where they could find Brian. You told them? Well, sure. I couldn't stand by and maybe risk you getting killed. Me. (laughs) I've always been rooting on your side, son. (laughs) (laughs) Julia, where is she? Just follow your ears, son. Julia. You told me once, Carl, that With or without me, you were here to stay. I've counted on that. Julia, your father just told me about the troops. I know. I was so terribly wrong, Carl. Can you ever forgive me? Julia. That night you helped Brian get away, he came for me. But I couldn't go because... Well, because I would have been the coward. To my own heart. Oh, good heavens. What's wrong? Almost sound as if I were proposing. Here you haven't even told me. That I love you? I've loved you, Julia, for as long as I can remember. Oh, darling. I was trying to tell you so the day that I played the song for you. The song you were playing just now. I know. The memory of the future. El recuerdo del porvenir. Those memories will be ours, Julia. We're at the beginning of that future right now. For both of us. Together.
Bruce Cabot and James Hilton will return in a moment. Along about this time of the year, do you get the urge to walk through a garden in bloom, see once again the charm of the old-fashioned garden variety flowers, the pinks, sweet peas, phlox, and marigolds, uh, maybe even morning glories and hollyhocks? Perhaps bend down to catch an extra whiff of fragrance or to pick a carnation to wear? <laughs> I guess we all do, but I was reminded of it particularly yesterday. I was in a store that had just put up their new Hallmark Valentines. And as I walked down the aisle for a moment, it seems I was carried off to an old-fashioned garden. Everywhere I looked, I saw color that was delicate and delightfully fresh. While the starched lace decorating some of the valentines reminded me of the crisp white collars and cuffs Mother wore. Of course, it was only an imaginative journey, but it gave my old winter heart a lift nonetheless. If you have that winterish feeling, you'll enjoy a trip down the valentine aisle of the store where you buy Hallmark cards. Hallmark has really captured that old-fashioned charm on their valentines again this year. And remember, this year, as always, Hallmark on the back of any card you send adds meaning. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you for a splendid performance on our Hallmark Playhouse tonight, Bruce Cabot. I understand you come from the great Southwest, so our story tonight probably brought back many memories for you. It certainly did, Mr. Hilton. And some of those memories were of a time a few years ago when millions of Americans were safeguarding the future of our country. And that's still important. Let's give the boys in the service all the help we can. I remember when I was in the service, it was really a thrill to answer the mail call. And now, when there's so many men in uniform again, let's be extra sure that they'll all find something there for them when mail time call comes around. Good night, Mr. Hilton. Good night, Bruce Cabot, and thanks oh, again. Uh, well, Mr. Hilton, before I leave, I want, to, I want you to know that I'll be listening next week. I understand that Hallmark Playhouse is presenting your own story, Goodbye, Mr. Chips, next Thursday. Yes, that's so, Bruce, and I must admit I'm looking forward to it, because we're going to have Mrs. Chips tell the story in our version next week, and I'm particularly happy that Deborah Carr will be with us to play Mrs. Chips. And by the way, talking of schools, do you realize that every year for the next six years there will be over one million children ready to start in the first grade of school? What can you do to make sure your children will receive the proper education? Two things. First, join and work with civic groups and school boards in your own community. And second, encourage young people to take up elementary school teaching as a lifetime profession. That's really important. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard Sinclair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Bruce Cabot can soon be seen in the RKO Technicolor production The Best of the Bad Men. The part of Julia tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle. Tom Tully was Jasper and Ted DeCourcy O'Brien. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse pre returns to present Deborah Carr in James Hilton's Goodbye Mr. Chips. And the week following, Irving Batchelor's story of Abraham Lincoln, A Man for the Ages. And the week after that, the story of Cinderella starring Judy Garland on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri.